Ladies and gentlemen, it is a very exciting day here on the channel, for I finally get to talk about the fabled Saturn 8 rocket, one of the more interesting concepts from the early space age. The Saturn, well it's called the Saturn C8 Nova to give it its full name, it's an enormous rocket as you can see as we fire up the eight F1 engines of the first stage. And uh, it's a product, that, it's, a, it's a rocket that very nearly went into production in lieu of the legendary Saturn V, the, the rocket that eventually got us to the moon. I haven't talked about this rocket in the past because I couldn't really come up with a good way to fabricate the shape of it in stock KSP, but now we have the new large part of the DLC, I think this is quite a good time to do a replica of it. Though it is still a little bit underscaled since the large diameter parts from the DLC are only Saturn V scaled and the, the Saturn VIII is bigger than that. Some of you may be familiar with this vehicle as the Nova 8L, which is kind of the most famous symbol of the Nova program, but it should be noted that the two are distinct. Practically speaking, they're identical, aside from the fact that the Saturn 8, which is the one I'm doing here, would have used 8J2 engines in the second stage rather than M1 engines that the Nova would have used. Though the Saturn, A8 is still a, the Saturn C8 is still a part of the Nova rocket family. And you know, with the DLC pack we have J2 engines and not M1 engines, so it makes more sense to recreate the Saturn 8 in KSP. And you know, it makes for a better YouTube video title as well, because it, it just sounds more clickbaity, doesn't it? And you know, that's what we need in this day and age. Um, but yes, introductions and formalities aside, some of you may be wondering, Matt, you secretive scallywag, what is this rocket and why is it so big? Well, I'm glad you asked, random viewer. Quick history lesson. At the end of World War II, Werner von Braun, I probably said that name wrong and I probably should not have pronounced that properly. <laughs> Werner von Braun. <laughs> began working for the USA's Army Ballistic Missile Association. Here, he and his team designed a multitude of launch vehicles for America, notably developing the rocket that propelled the US's first satellite, the Explorer 1, into orbit. However, the might of the Soviet Union's R-7 was making headlines by uh, launching the Sputnik 1 and Sputnik 2 satellites into orbit, the latter weighing in at half a metric tonne, almost 40 times heavier than the Explorer 1 that America launched. Needless to say, America wasn't going to back down so easily. Von Braun and his crack team of merry men were assimilated into NASA to begin work on a super heavy launcher with one objective alone, to put a man on the moon insert that REM song there. But then the question became, how do you even get to the moon? There were two methods proposed, direct ascent and lunar orbit rendezvous. A multiple launch plan was also considered, but in terms of actual moon landing, those are our two choices. We know from history that NASA went with the lunar orbit rendezvous and executed this with the Saturn V. Um, but I'm sure, I'm sure many of you will be aware um, that lunar orbit rendezvous consists of inserting a spacecraft into lunar orbit, followed by the deployment of a separate landing craft to touch down on the lunar surface, and then, you know, once the astronauts had taken their selfies, done their Instagramming and all that, uh, they'd re-embark the lander and ascend back up to meet them with the command pod again, at which point they'd reunite and begin the trip home. But what is direct ascent, and why does it necessitate such a mammoth rocket by comparison? Well, direct ascent is by far the more Kerbal approach. It's easier, more intuitive by design, and uh, needs more boosters. Direct Ascent describes the method of going to the moon without all of this silly messing around in lunar orbit and spacecraft reconfiguration. It's a simple spaceship that goes to the moon, spaceship lands on the moon, and the spaceship returns to Earth. None of this, you know, messing around, assembling the craft in Earth orbit, no separate landing craft. You got one ship, one docking, straight there, straight back. It truly is the, uh, the brute force approach and is usually the way that people land on the moon in Kerbal Space Program due to the fact it's much easier and requires, you know, no necessary knowledge of rendezvous. And actually in KSP it's more efficient to do it this way because the moon is so much smaller than the moon. Separate landers in the game are, you know, they're far more necessitated for places like Tylo and Eve. And just a quick note here actually, uh, just to demonstrate the power of the, uh, the Saturn C8, I was playing, uh, with, a. Uh, to plus 2.25 gravity hack, so you know, just so this wasn't this thing wasn't completely overbuilt. But then when I turned off the hack gravity thing for the rest of the mission, I forgot that uh, the actual orbital velocity would be co be conserved, and so the speed we needed to get into a stable orbit at 2.25 gravity meant that we were now we're now on an escape trajectory. So we're kind of doing this weird thing where we now need to slow ourselves down <laughs> to get a money counter rather than uh, speed up as you would conventionally do so. But I digress here. 
In the real world, direct ascent requires a much heavier booster, and by Von Braun's calculations, the rocket would have had to require about 14 million pounds of thrust at launch, nearly twice the power of the Saturn V, and an excellent example of just how colossal this rocket would have been. As someone who's had the privilege of seeing the Saturn V at the Kennedy Space Center, I find it quite hard to imagine the staggering size the Saturn 8 would have to be, towering 70 feet taller than the Saturn 5 and weighing 18,000 metric tons heavier. The immense size of the C8 helped put it uh, help put the proverbial nails in the coffin, so to speak. The first stage would create so much noise during static testing and such a blast diameter if it exploded that it was doubtful if it could even be tested and launched at Cape Canaveral. So it would have to be probably it, it would probably need its construction of an offshore platform for launching it, or perhaps to launch it from an uninhabited island. Either way, it was going to be tricky. Aside from launch issues, constructing itself was a problem as well. No factory in the US was tall enough to permit construction of such a colossal fuselage, even if the stage were lying on its side. Over the course of the summer and autumn of 1961, more and more and more problems, namely cost issues and launch problems, just ended up piling up against the Nova program and the writing was on the wall before the year was up. The rocket would never be built. But you know, I love a good underdog story, and the Saturn C8 is certainly an underdog. Uh, a much bigger and more powerful and generally more impressive looking underdog, but you know, an underdog nonetheless. And you know, everyone's recreating Saturn V's in KSP, and I wanted to break the trend, and also I've recreated Saturn V's several times in the past, so it's all about breaking my own trends as well. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this little trip down memory lane as we uh, carry on with the mission, but uh, yeah, this is a, I guess, I guess now that massive introduction is aside, this is the recreation of a mission that never existed. I quite like recreating missions that never happened because there's no way people will call out historical, uh, historical inaccuracies because I can just play the, yo, it's, it's all about your interpretation, bro, card. I don't know, I, I guess some of you will still find mistakes here and there throughout this mission, but hopefully nothing too egregious. If you enjoyed this video and want to read up, I have linked my sources down below and you know if some of you want more videos like this then I do upload KSP every Saturday so remember to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell if you want push notifications I'm told uh, that this is the stuff that YouTubers say uh, in videos so that's what I'm doing now um, you know and remember to smash that like button and uh, of course my Twitter is in the description where I post the freshest of KSP memes and quite at quite an alarming frequency uh, sometimes I wonder what I'm doing with my life and you know, there's, there's my Discord and Patreon too, if either of, either of those things interest you, but that's all from me. And I think that's all my uh, YouTube admin I needed to cover in this video. Um, now I'm, you know, I've got I to gotta embrace what, what YouTube seems to favour, and this is what it seems to favour, so this is what I'm embracing. Yes. So, uh, the most difficult part of this mission is out of the way, our uh, launch at 2.25 gravity hack, and, uh, you know, getting to the mana are all done. All that's left to do now is a uh, return to Kerbin so we can fire up the Ascent module. By the way, it's never really been, obviously the program was scrapped before any designs were finalised. It's never really been clear exactly what the lander would have looked like for the Saturn C8, but the most popular design is this sort of thing where it's, just, it's a double stage to land on the MUN, so we kind of ditch a tank and then fire up a very an engine with a very small fuel tank that basically just is there for the landing part. And then we have this sort of upper stage that um, fires much like the uh, the actual uh, Eagle lander, what's it called? Just the Apollo lander that was used. Uh, it's just like its own stage that ascends and leaves the landing legs on the surface of the Mun. What a terribly phrased sentence that was, but uh, I think you've got the message okay. Uh, nothing more to it really. I'm not really trying. I don't. I'm not really doing anything fancy at this point. We're just returning to Kerbin. It's not a particularly faithful recreation of how NASA would have got back to Kerbin because I'm just going straight in for a very steep re-entry because realistic entries, sometimes you don't really slow down fast enough and you end up coming out of the atmosphere and doing a, a kind of another orbit around Kerbin. And I thought, let's just go with a nice quick re-entry. There's no need for this video to go on longer than it really needs to. So, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just try and get back as fast as we can. So all that's left to do now is one final burn of 244.2 meters per second to uh, get ourselves on a MUN trajectory and a Kerbin atmospheric encounter, which we can execute now. But we're just using the Spark engine because I didn't plan to use hacked gravity for the actual MUN ascent, so just going for an efficient engine that provided just enough TWR 
to get us off the lunar surface was, was enough for the uh, the purposes that I needed anyway. And there we are, that burn is done. And so we can probably just detach the lower stage now, to be honest, and just coast our way home. I didn't, I had, I, I should have probably shaved off some of the ablator, a little PSA. For those unaware, the ablators in this game are very, very overpowered, especially for MUN missions. Just, you know, you right click on it in the VAB or a space bit hanger or whatever, and just uh, shave off all, uh, a lot of ablator, as you can see. We're coming in pretty fast at a very, very steep angle. Very unrealistic G-forces there. And as you can see, we've basically used none, none of the ablator. What is that? Uh, 30 units out of the 500. So I would definitely advocate shaving some of that off. Uh, if you're only going to the Mun, or places like Juna as well. I guess just Elu and Jewel and Moho sometimes are the only places that would really necessitate that much, and even then it's a bit of a stretch, to be honest. Um, but there we are, touching down. I've, I, I did the Twitter and plugging all of that in the middle of the video this time, because it's always a massive rush doing it at the end and realising I don't have enough time to, uh, to talk about it. So, oh no, it's just over 10 minutes long. I'm sorry. I just looked at the timer. I didn't intend for it to be exactly 10 minutes. People get annoyed when it's exactly 10 minutes. I didn't... I didn't plan it out this way, but it that way, but there we go. I hope you enjoyed this video, there's a little pan around of the command pod, and on screen are some links to other recreations I've done, including the Soviet uh, Union recreation and another NASA moon uh, mission that never happened. Uh, but that's it, uh, thank you for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend.